You're not gonna believe this guy's story. From weapons engineering tech, to banker, to photographer filmmaker, Matt's had an eclectic past, all leading to a life of creativity and adventure. Currently running a production company in Atlantic Canada, his company focuses their time on video production, while he fosters his love for photography during his downtime. Matt has a crazy story that I honestly didn't know much about before this chat, and it turned out to be an amazing chat, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So please welcome Matt Burton to the podcast. Okay, so we've got Matt Burton on the podcast, and uh, I, I've we just had a hell of a time getting this thing going, but we got there, man. And yeah. uh, like you said, maybe we won't call ourselves video professionals uh, throughout this, but two video professionals trying to get a Zoom meeting running or a Discord running. Aspiring it, video professionals. Aspiring. Let's let, yeah, we have to go with that. We have to go with that this evening. Um, thanks for coming on, dude. And and I've also learned just like a ton more about you. Oh. Um, well, you know, you go through something like we just did together, you know, half an hour of troubleshooting on Zoom. You, you get to know each other a little bit, right? Oh, so, yeah. Things get uh, intimate. <laughs> so anyway, tell the people like where you're from, what you're doing. Um, you're Halifax based, right? Yeah, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, part of the beautiful Atlantic provinces of Canada. Uh, and yeah, I run a production company here called Rove Productions. Uh, and that's been in operation for about two years now. Um, and then I've been, I guess, making videos and taking photos for about three and a half years total. So I, I jumped to the game a little bit late when I when I was 26 is when I really kind of got my first camera, started diving into it. And uh, nice. honestly, I haven't looked back since. And... This isn't something I was planning on asking, but I just learned that you're in that you were in the Navy. And I think that's an important thing to let's just like talk about that right off the bat, because that's a very <clears throat> unique circumstance. We don't hear that a whole lot in, in the community that I'm in. You you're in the Navy and then you become a photographer and you run your own. Then you start running your own video production company. Like how the hell does that all work, man? Yeah, it's honestly, it's not a linear path whatsoever. So right out of high school, I went to uh <laughs> like I I've had so many life plans that have altered, but I got out of high school, went to university for sciences because I want to be a dentist. That was a dream for me. I was like eight years of school, crush it, wow. be a dentist. I don't know. I love teeth. It's really weird because really? I read somewhere that dentists have like the highest depression rate out of most professions. Suicide like, rate. I think it was. <clears throat> yes. Like that yeah. And I was, yeah. Blew my mind. Cause I'm like, I don't know what could be better than going giving people better smiles, just hanging out in an office, listening to music. I think it'd be sweet. <laughs> so, That's such uh, a good outlook. I know. So I made it about a semester into my, uh, my program and I didn't have bad grades. Like I was A's and B's throughout university, except calculus. I failed horrendously. Um, and, and I just didn't take the prerequisites in high school. I was just able to like silver tongue my way into a calculus class in high school, got other people to do my work to get a passing grade and then was able to scoop by in university, which ultimately bit me in the ass. But yeah, so after that semester at university, I uh, just couldn't really envision myself spending eight years in university plus whatever sort of uh, clinical side there was to dental school. So uh, I dropped out. I had a bit of a panic phase because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And weirdly enough, at, at 18, 19, all of my friends in school knew what they wanted to do which has since changed 10 times over for them. But at the time yeah, it was right. a lot of, it was a lot of stress on an 18 year old. Cause I'm like, well, damn, it's like, everybody knows what they want to do except me. So I knew my dad and my brother were both in the military. They seemed to like it. The pay was great, full benefits. They were traveling the world. So I thought, Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. They're both pretty happy folks. Let's give it a go. So I went to apply to join the air force, like my brother and father. And there was an officer that convinced me to go Navy. Uh, long story short, after a few hiccups, um, I got accepted uh, into a program <clears throat> super fast, by the way. I got a call on December 4th. They swore me into the military December 6th, and I was on a plane December 8th to fly to Newfoundland to start my course. Wow. Yeah, so I did a two-year program fast. in Newfoundland at Memorial University for electromechanical engineering, uh, and that was two years, and I got posted back to Halifax, and I did three years on the ships. Uh, it was supposed to be four. But uh, I really didn't want to stay in. And I was with the program I went to. They gave me a, a civilian diploma and sent me to a civilian school. So um, the whole step with that was every uh, year in school was two years of service. So two years school, four years service, six year contract. 
but wow. I just, I, I couldn't see myself sticking through that. So I, I had to find like some way to get out early. And the only way that I could find was them saying like, we well, have to pay back all the training in the school, which was about a hundred and some odd thousand dollars, some arbitrary number that they tossed to it to kind of try and have, you know, avoid having people trying to get out. So I was like, okay, I was like, Whoa. I don't have that kind of money to spend. Um, <clears throat> so I took a ceremonial posting in Ottawa. So I stood on our guard in front of like the war memorial with the rifle and the uniform just stood still all day for two and a half, three months. Um, and I was able to chat with my career counselor. I was like, we have to collectively find a loophole in this contract. I was like, cause I can't do another three and a half, four years so we scoured yeah. through this like hundred page document and we found a loophole sure enough. And they were prompt, they were prompt to fill this loophole after I had found it out and got out. But what it was is they marketed it for every year in school was two years of service. It was actually every day in class was two days of service. So I was able to write off my work term, the program I went, I'm, I was in, had more time off than any other military program. So I was able to write off my summer vacation, my March break, Easter weekend, Christmas, my work term, all my weekends and any sort of stat holidays. And it was able to knock 13 months off my contract. So I actually got out about a, just over a year early for my contract, uh, which was a godsend. Cause I just, I couldn't get out of that organization fast. What? Yeah. Like it's that great is... for some people learned a lot, you know, definitely had to deal with stress in the uh, 10 situations, but um, wow. yeah, it was, it was a, it was a wild ride, man. A lot of adventures. Wow. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> That's the craziest story I think I've heard out there so far. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh, it's pretty hectic, man. So, okay. Obviously, I mean, I'd love to chat more about that. Maybe maybe we will, but how does that... So, did you always have a love for photography or, or was no, that... No, not even. I hadn't touched a camera. I, I wasn't even creative at all through school. Like, not... Wow. I mean, high school, you have to take some sort of arts uh elective so i did drumline my school offered that surprisingly so i didn't join the, i literally just played snare drum snapped my chest like the nick cannon movie did that for three years it was great met some <laughs> met some of my best friends in that program which is hilarious people i still talk to today um but that was really my only exposure to like the arts as a mm. whole i mean i was always into movies i've been a movie buff my whole life um but not even from like a technical standpoint of like, oh, the cinematography, this is beautiful or, or, right. or the script writing of the story is, is amazing. It's just visually, I just always love to escape in movies. It's just been something I've always enjoyed. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. really the extent um, of, of dipping my toes, so to speak, in the arts industry. Um, again, it wasn't Crazy. until, you know, two, I'll say wrong turn career attempts that led me to a really, really weird pass at life that somehow a camera ended up in my lap and changed everything unbelievable man that's that's I, I yeah i usually don't hear that like myself i was always um like i actually didn't take photography class which is strange in high school but i was like really into the video stuff yeah. we had like a little video program in our high school which i'm like super thankful for they had like premiere like one like the first like and like final cut one like it was yeah, like the, yeah you know so it was nice to but Dude, it took like four, like if I wanted to like zoom in a, a picture, like I tried to make a, a documentary one time, I had to render like for four hours just to zoom a photo. Like it was insane. Yeah. Oh no. I might as well just film the photo, but. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. I think I'm spoiled in that regards because you know, when I got into video, it was, uh, it was already at a place where, you know, software was relatively seamless. As long as you had a computer yeah. capable of handling some of the stuff and the render times, it was, uh, yeah. Just as as you know, as slow as your imagination was, was basically the speed at which you could move. <laughs> exactly, which is real nice. So, like, yeah. how long have you been in? I don't even say the industry. Like, how long have you been doing video? Because you guys really, I know you do photo and video. Yeah. Um, but you you focus mostly mostly on video. Yeah, our, our main focus is as a uh, like a, a full service production house. Um, my business partner does do uh, photography contracts that we'll have from time to time or okay. uh, with some of the smaller contracts, video contracts we get. Normally they ask if we can uh, add the additional like photo packages to that as well. And Riker yeah. is my business partner. Rofe loves photography, loves doing it. So he just, and he, he likes, I think he almost likes doing it more uh, from a client base and like a personal base. Um uh, he just right. gets like really jazzed on taking rad photos that people just get excited about, whether it's just like lifestyles for a client or product photography. Um, <clears throat> and I genuinely love photo 
too. Like so much, I'm, I'm such a fanboy of photography, but I love it so much that I never want to do it paid. Cause I'm so worried that the moment I accept payment, oh. it becomes a job and then it'll no longer be my escape. Cause right now, if I'm having a stressful week where I need to get out of my own head, I'll grab my photo camera. I'll take the dog. I'll go on a hike by myself and just enjoy nature. I'll take photos and you know, half the time I won't even share them with anyone. I just keep them on a little folder, on my laptop for like little mementos and keepsakes. And it's just putting music on, whether it's classical That's or cool. hip hop or dubstep, like literally any genre and just edit photos for hours and hours and hours, photos that will never see the light of day, but just the process of, of taking this image I've seen and trying to edit it to a point where visually to me, it evokes the same emotion that I felt in that moment of taking the photo. So in hopes that if someone does see it, they can kind of feel what I felt at the moment. That's so therapeutic for me. Um, and I just know the moment I start exchanging that for money, it'll just take away that therapy aspect for me. It was the same thing for video. So like I was, I loved doing video when I first started it. And I used to do personal videos all the time. But then the moment I started doing it more and more for work, it felt like more of a chore anytime I want to do it for myself. Like I've been, I've been on my own ass for th literally three years, pretty much since I started doing video to start a YouTube channel. And I've dabbled from time to time, but then I just get so caught up, especially from like a perfectionism standpoint, where we try to keep our, our videos for clients at such a high level that when it comes to YouTube videos, I almost can't turn that off and just be like, this is meant to be more raw, more uncut, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah, in short, I've been doing video now for just uh, just under four years. I, I got my first camera at 26, a little bit later in life, 30 now. And yeah, I've been doing it ever since. Well, your your stuff is is really, really, really good, man. Like really nice. It's gorgeous. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, your, your, your guys' style is great. Obviously, your Instagram feed your Instagram feed looks like what my Instagram feed looks like on steroids or like in my dreams, basically like anyone's Insta, like it's crazy, dude. Like the, it just hooks you right away, which is why you have like 20,000 followers, I guess. No, no. So it's funny thing. The 20,000 followers, uh, quite literally came overnight. Um, wow. I was in Iceland in September and I was taking some video and weirdly enough, like Iceland, I've been there twice. It's my favorite country in the world. Um, and I was at another past in life where I was in a bit of a creative rut. I just needed to kind of need an escape. So <clears throat> we did good last year. I had a little bit extra money kicked around. So I'm like, I'm going to take a trip for me. Hopped in a camper van, drove around the island by myself. Got virtually no content. Like I, I had such high expectations because I'd been there before. I kind of knew what to expect. Um, and I'm like, cool, I'm going to get so many photos, so many videos. Uh, and then when I went there, it was during the storm season in September. As soon as I landed, they said it was the worst autumn storm they'd ever seen. Three of the highways were shut down, high winds, heavy rain. And it rained, every, it rained every day I was there. And two of the days, snowstorm. Get out. Yikes. Yeah. So, I mean, still super thankful that I got to go, but. The amount of content I got was uh, <clears throat> was very uh, lackluster in, in comparison to what I had hoped for. But yeah, while I was there, I, I got a couple cool drone clips of some dream destinations I always want to see in Iceland. I stitched them together for a four-second Instagram reel. And that hit 1.5 million views, I think, in, in like five or six days. Holy and then just crap. a slew of, slew of followers came from that, and that's it. But the shitty thing about that is... That's crazy. Um, like, it just... Um, of like the 12,000 new followers that came from that, I would argue like six plus are just bots. Cause when they see an, when like you see an account getting a bunch of like authentic followers, bots just leech onto that and start following and just engagement and stuff like that doesn't follow through. But yeah. And, and not only like, even if they aren't bots, it it's, it's not the same as growing an audience like slowly, right? Like you post and then you get a hundred followers and you post and you get a hundred and you, like doing that method yeah um then you're <clears throat> the gonna engagement get more, doesn't follow exactly you're gonna get more yeah. um like true fans i guess you would say and like people that are more likely to comment on your stuff because you see these accounts that have like 160,000 followers and then you look and there's like five comments it's like there's yeah how how does doesn't make any sense right so um so you you don't do you use that platform like do you use your instagram um to get work at all then or is it just kind of funny enough <clears throat> no I, I would say most of our work now comes from word of mouth um kind of going into our, our second full year now as Royal Productions. Good. Um, we've we've done pretty well for ourselves last year of getting our name out there. And realistically Halifax is a pretty small city. There's like we are 
always surprised when we do Google searches for like Halifax production companies, how many pop up. Yeah. But the amount of companies that are actually being utilized for work isn't really that high. Yeah. And it's because a lot of the ones that used to do work don't really do work now. They kind of did it back before video was super prevalent. And then, gotcha. you know, realistically now, anyone who buys like a mirrorless camera, theoretically with a good eye and someone who knows how to edit and, and kind of construct a bit of story can do yeah. video work because you don't need teams of like five, 10 people anymore. I mean, no. for certain shoots you do, but yeah. So it was kind of really easy to, to, uh, make make a hole for ourselves in the market to kind of fill and, and service people. So yeah, word of mouth is the biggest thing. And my, and my business partner, Riker, when he was in university, he was on the rugby team and um, he taught a class at his university while he was attending. Um, and that man networked more than I've seen any other human do over the course of like five years. And that was seven years ago. And the, the, those networking days that he spent back in university are paying dividends today. Like I would, I would argue to say 60 wow. to 70% of our clients that we've gotten up to this point are from old connections he's made university. It's crazy. That's great. Well, so what was he doing before you guys started the company <clears throat> together? Uh, he was doing kinesiology and he was also a strength and conditioning coach at a, a CrossFit gym. Wow. Yeah. What the hell? You guys have the crazy backstory, man. Like Yeah, and he did, he didn't get his first camera till he was uh 24? Yeah, 24. Wow. Cuz he he's 2 years younger than me, so he's 20 28 now. It's not fair, you guys. That's not fair. You're I just good. obsessed about it. I obsessed about it. Like when I I didn't have a choice, so kind of to go back a bit further, a uh, big turning point in my life after I'd left the military, uh, I'd went back to school and got an advanced diploma in finance and investment management. Cause I just, in the military, I really loved money. I don't know what it was about it. I'm just, I mean, I'm sure everyone's, you know, the same to an extent. So I'm like, <laughs> I just want to deal with money. So I went back to school, uh, two of the best years of my life at Nova Scotia community college. That's like the, the college here, um, from the faculty to the student body, uh, to just the networking, not even within the field of study, but everything that came with being a student at that school changed my life tenfold. Like I, I legitimately wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now if it wasn't for uh, my main instructor and current mentor, Barb Powers there. I still chat with her frequently when life's kind of cool. like going in too many directions and she'll narrow me down. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I did that program right after the military. <laughs> uh, met a girl, we got engaged, uh, traveled Europe a bit, we bought a house. Um, and I got a job at that hedge fund company. It's, uh, called Mitsubishi, not the car company. Uh, I thought it was too originally, but it's, it's the fourth <laughs> largest bank in the world. What? Yeah, it's crazy. So I, I had a job, uh, as wow. a hedge fund transfer agent. So I was, uh, subscribing and redeeming, uh, billionaires and millionaires out of these hedge funds. So I'm moving like tens of millions of dollars a week, um, but the pay was terrible and you're in a cubicle farm and you're looking at two screens. And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, this is uh, I was like, this is not where I thought I was gonna be at at 25, 26. So then uh excuse me, me and my fiance end up splitting up a couple months out from our wedding. Uh, I'd moved out of the house that we'd bought, moved back with my parents. Um, and at this point, I had still yet to really touch a camera or have an interest in photography. <laughs> My life is just pretty much in shambles at this point. I'm like, oh, it's like, how did I like virtually from a societal standpoint, have everything figured out? Like, you know, family, <laughs> the house, the white picket fence, the dog, the corporate job. And I'm just like throwing it all away. Right. So yeah. I moved back with my parents. I'm like, man, I was like, I got to I got to figure something out because I just like my my life just did a 180 in the direction I did not want it to go. Right. So I went to my boss at work. I'm like, when? Because I'd been there for three months maybe at this point i was like when can i apply for vacation and he's like it's prorated from when you start take it whenever i was like i need two weeks in june he's like you got it so i took my two weeks in june took off to iceland picked up a camera uh went over there for 10 days by myself and i was like cool I was like i'm just gonna take photos i need to be alone complete solitude with my thoughts um, so I went there in June during midnight sun. So for a couple of days, the sun didn't really set. It just kind of like kissed the horizon and came back up. And it was my second last day on the Island. Um, and there's this, uh, U S Naval plane crash that I really wanted to check out in the South part of the Island, just outside the town of Vic. So I parked my car. It's about a 10 kilometer round trip, uh, walked out to this black sand desertous beach. And there's this plane sitting by itself. No one there, but me. It's probably like 11.45 at night. So most people are packed in or sleeping, but 
it's golden hour for like six hours. So beautiful, beautiful day. So I'm there, wow. I'm scawking around this plane, snapping a couple photos. And then I turn around to leave. And as I turn around to leave, the sun had just cracked the horizon of the tallest glacier or the biggest glacier in Iceland. And like, I have a photo on my Instagram of it. The sky is literally just it, it, like, all I can think about is game of Thrones. Cause I'm looking at this massive glacial ice cap, but then you have this sun that has the sky on fire, like, like such a, such a deep orange with like almost like black crusting on the clouds. It, it was the most insane sky I've seen in my entire life. So I snapped the photo. That's crazy. And in that moment, I'm looking at the photo. I'm by myself. The wind's kind of blowing. And I thought, shit. I was like, this is an exhilarating feeling. It's weirdly peaceful, but also exhilarating. I'm like, what I now know that I need to do is when I get home, I need to chase some semblance of this feeling for the rest of my life. It has to be it. I was like, I've never felt wow. so energized, but so at peace at the same time. It was this weird duality that I was going through. So I flew home 48 hours later. Uh, went back to work Monday, handed in my two week notice. And I was like, I, uh, I was like, yeah, this is, this is my final stop in the financial industry. And like, what are you going to do? I was like, I gotta do something with the camera. And then they're like, what, like what with the camera? I'm like, I don't know yet, man. I was like, I just bought this camera. I had a blast in Iceland. I was like, I just want to take photos, do some videos. <laughs> and then, um, literally after my last day, I set out to only do photo and video for monetary compensation for at that point, I was like for the rest of my life. And, um, yeah, it was a super bumpy road. Um, very bumpy, very poor. Like it was just, it was not, there was, there was a thousand and one reasons why I should have just stopped either rejoined the military or went back to a firm or got a job elsewhere. But, um, you know, given the situation and the things that I gave up, I was like, you know, you kind of had your chance at going down that path. Like you really have to go all in on this. Cause if not, then you're going to regret leaving a past life to half-ass this, to just kind of fail at that too. So when I tell you, I went 110% towards photo and video with zero experience. I went like 110%. I ended up getting one contracting job to splice video for uh, the government of Alberta for like some pipeline video they're doing through another company in the city. And as soon as I left that, I got a call from someone who had seen my resume on um, uh, Indeed. And they offered me a full-time position doing photos and videos of cars for their lead gen business. So essentially, they just did lead gens and sold them to dealerships. And they had their small uh, allotment of cars that I would just take photos and make videos for. So I did that full-time cool. Monday to Friday. And then I picked up a part-time job. Friday, Saturday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights at Henry's camera shop here. Cause I was like, what better place to learn about cameras than here? Got the job there. And then, so yeah, Monday to Friday was doing the automotive stuff. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, working Crazy. at Henry's Friday night and Saturday night from 12 AM till 3 AM. I would film DJs at the nightclub because I, I had zero experience in any sort of video work. So I was like, I need to kind of do something. So anytime DJs came into town, I'd be like 300 bucks. I'll film a little highlight video for you for your social media. And they ate it up. And I was like somewhat good at it, I suppose. Cause they kept, you know, asking that's these a, little highlight videos. That's a good idea. And this yeah, is on top then, of like all the other stuff. This is Yeah. So full time Monday to Friday evenings and weekends at Henry's and then doing that on top of everything. And that's, that's solely just, I was like, I just need to be, I needed to be basically every hour of my day had to either be consumed with using a camera to take photos and make videos or watching tutorials on YouTube or taking class. I get online because I have zero experience. I don't know a single person in the creative space where I live. I was like, I just need to get so immersed in this that everyone knows who I am. So on top of all those things, I committed to doing a video edit every single day for a year wow. on my Instagram. I only made it to, I think, 72 days. Because at that good. point, around the 72 day mark, I had a bunch of random small businesses and real estate agents reaching out to me to do video work that it was on top of everything else. It was just like insanity. It's like no one could have kept up with that. So um, tailored off the daily videos, started wow. doing some uh, random small video jobs. And uh, that just slowly snowballed with a, a thirst and a hunger to keep sharpening my skills and to... Um, meeting my best friend and business partner through Instagram and kicking off Rove. And now we're here. Dude, that is such a fun story. Like I, I <clears throat> don't, I didn't think anyone, I don't know if I've ever like even thought about that. Like someone just being like, okay, 
that's like more than 110 percent. like that's crazy dude that's like it's like a 200 you're just all like i don't know if i could do that personally i think i would like burn out or i would get sick of the thing too fast like you know you go too hard at something and then you know but obviously that never happened right i it's definitely not sustainable i mean that that cycle lasted for like just over two months yeah but i mean you know yeah, yeah. you commit something like that or schedule like that for 70 straight days i mean it doesn't yeah. matter really what you deem success you're gonna you're definitely gonna be further ahead than where you started going at that rate I think it was just a smart strategy that you had though, just being like, I'm going, I'm doing everything I do in my life is going to be surrounded by cameras or whatever. I'm thinking yeah. of the Henry's thing, right? That that's even the Henry's move is smart because you get to learn about the gear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was insane. Like Henry's was really the, uh, the golden ticket, so to speak, because a bit of discounts on gear. Right. So it kind of made, well, I mean, it, it obviously made obtaining gear better, um, but just the people I worked with, you know, a lot of the people were a little bit older than me, probably in their 40s, some in their 50s, and they'd been doing photo for 20 plus years, right? There wasn't yeah. really anyone doing video at Henry's. It was pretty much all photo, but still, I mean, so many of the rules of photo apply directly to video, right? And cinematography. Yeah. So yeah. soaking up information from them was uh, was crucial for me at the time, crucial. And you met Riker on instagram you said and you guys yeah just <clears throat> it was like- when i was doing doing those daily videos i was at some spray painted bulldozer and he's like yo where's this bulldozer to and i told him he's like unreal we should get coffee sometime and we went out for coffee that week and i i think i've literally seen him every single day since that moment <laughs> other other wow. than when i would go on a trip or him and his him and his wife would go on a trip somewhere that's, yeah and, that's I, and now we're business partners so you know, you probably yeah. didn't see that coming. Like, yeah, I'm going to see this guy. You never really would, would assume that. No, yeah, I'll see no. this guy every day for like the next however many years from this But I didn't on. even have a plan either. Like at the point when he'd messaged me, I didn't know what a year looked, even six months from then looked. I'm just like, I have enough money to pay for rent right now. And I get to play with the camera all day. So, I mean, win-win kind of. Right? Yeah. And what, so what was that conversation like that you guys had? Um, like, did, did he sort of approach you and he wanted to start a company and, and sort of like tried to recruit you to it or something? No, it honestly was, um, oh God, it was super organic. And I think that's why we work as a team so well together. Cause we kind of really fell into this, this partnership and, and this production company really, um, cause him and I had much more experience individually in photo than video. I probably had a bit more experience in video than him just because I was doing uh, those daily videos and a couple smaller jobs for a couple like mom pop shops around here and then some real estate agents. Um, but the gym that he was doing strength and conditioning at his, his role there slowly morphed into kind of uh, their director or their creative director, so to speak. So the owner of the gym there, who's, who's uh, still a good friend of ours ended up um, getting Riker like a, a gimbal for his iPhone and then Riker was doing videos for the social media, photos for the social media. Then he ended up buying himself a camera because he really enjoyed it and he wanted to step up the production for them. And then it became that he was just doing all of their photo, all of their video with his his um, his A6400, I think it was. And then he got like a an A7S2. And then, um, yeah, so him and I were kind of doing our own thing individually. And then um, he... I was really into doing like creative portraits for a while on my Instagram. Um, and I had this idea, I don't know where it came from, but I had, I have a really nice red velvet suit coat or coat suit or jacket with like a black lapel. I was like, I just want to wear this. I want to have a (laughs) bottle of champagne, two champagne flutes in my hand. And I just want to fall into a lake, but like get a photo of me at like 45 degrees over the lake. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, that's a rad idea. He's like, we should totally do it. So one summer day in like June or July, uh, we went down to a lake just across the street, really from my house. Um, and then we found this little private dock that this, uh, this guy let us use. I went on the dock and I fell down. I took a photo and like, it didn't go viral by any means, but like it was shared pretty much throughout the whole creative community in Halifax. Nice. And Riker and myself were like very front facing with our Instagram stories. Um, and we dabbled with YouTube. We like vlogs from time to time. Um, so we pretty much documented the whole process of the conceptualizing the idea, looking for a location, having that fail, finding the ultimate location. <clears throat> and people really just liked how we fed off each other on our Instagram stories. 
and someone reached out and said, Hey, do you guys work together? They're like, no, we're just, you know, friends who hang out and do photos and video. And then um, they asked, well, would you guys be willing to, you know, do a video for us as like a duo? And we're like, yeah, I mean, we never thought about it. So sure. And we did that. And that literally just snowballed into the production company today. Like wow. we, we, we have pretty different styles to an extent, um, but I think they complement one another, especially yeah. um, the roles we've kind of fallen into now that we're like in our second year with this company. So yeah, it was just uh, super organic, but it was great. That's amazing, dude. So what, what kind of roles uh, do you both individually play? <clears throat> I, I, and do you like swap roles? Like will one person DOP, one person direct and like vice versa, or do you kind of, yeah, that was, that role? was pretty much exactly what it was when we started. Um, one shoot, you know, he would, uh, DP, uh, I would direct next shoot. I would direct, he would DP or, you know, even depending on who would be in, uh, answering client queries in our email or handling the correspondence with our clients, they would normally be the one directing and the other person would DP. Right. Um, but now we, we've even transitioned further, you know, when I first started personally, <clears throat> it came from a, like a very like jaded chip on my shoulder thing because I'd reached out to a bunch of creative people in the industry and really got no replies from anybody. And I mean, rightfully so. There's no reason why they should be responding to me or talking to me. So I was like, I'm doing everything by <laughs> myself, right? I was like, I want to get the client. I want to shoot. I want to edit. I want the praise. Um, and then, you know, I, I quickly lost that mentality when I realized how beneficial it was to have people far more talented than I am in certain areas, handle those aspects of productions. And then for me to focus where my talents shine. So specifically where we're at now, Riker will pretty much handle uh, client correspondence and he'll direct and produce some of our projects. Um, I handle pretty much all of the post-production side of things. So the editing, the coloring, the sound design, um, he'll normally chop up interviews. Just, I just, I can't sit through the monotony of listening to someone talk for an hour, but he, he loves it. So he'll chop it up nice and then I'll finish off the video. Um, and then we hire out for our DP now. Um, and that's something recent that just started for us this nice. year. Once we got back from, uh, from a trip to Uganda, um, we just have a, an immensely talented friend, Josh Saunders here, who freelance DPs for some short films, some docs, and then a couple of production companies in the city. Um, and then after seeing what he can do to elevate the overall vibe and look of our videos, it was just a no brainer. We're like it's, it's money more well, like we're gaining more from having him than losing with having to hire him. So it's just, it's a no brainer at this point. So, man, that's a really good tip. I think for like anyone who's, not only like you, you always think of hiring out when you're too busy to do it. I think that's what I usually think, right? Like that's my mentality usually, but to hire out when it's someone that's like, just like super skilled and is going to bring your productions to another level, um, is as a smart idea. Even if you guys could do it, I think, um, there's always that ne next level that some people have. Yeah. And even sometimes the gear that might come with the DP is even better than what you guys might have right so it's yeah kind of i mean his, his his gear list is, is insane too for the most part and and even with some bigger shoots now it's like we're kind of at a spot now it's like do we buy more gear or do we just um fit in like a, a rental fee for these larger productions and just go rent the gear right is it is it cheaper in the long run for us just to rent this use it for this shoot because realistically we might use it for two shoots throughout the year so is it really worth investing thousands yeah. of dollars in this piece right so um yeah we're just um yeah we're at a place now where we're just trying to think a little bit more uh methodical and logical with with uh gear we purchase and how we handle shoots but also like not being, I guess, stingy with our money. Cause beforehand we'd be like, Oh, like you and I could easily handle this and we get a little bit more money because we want to hire people. Exactly. But, but now I'm like, which is good. And I mean, to your point, like a lot of times we don't need to hire someone because that's a really small shoot. Like having three people would just sure, be a waste sure. of resources. Yeah. But other times, you know, it's like, cool. It's like, if we hire, you know, this DP for like a thousand bucks for the day, it's like, the video is going to look substantially better, right? Like I like to color footage and I like coloring my footage, but when I get to color Josh's footage, I can just do such a better job coloring because he has his lighting so dialed in and how he has his interview set up and his B-roll set up. I'm like, like it makes me not even want to pick up a camera for, for client work anymore. <laughs> I just want to hire him, right? Like I'll always do my own videos for like when I'm traveling and hanging out with friends for memories, but I'm like, yeah. 
God, this guy just sh- showed me a, a completely different side to cinematography and filmmaking that I didn't know. And I'm like, I can't not unsee your work now. Like you're, exactly. you're it's just yeah, there. I'm stuck. I'm stuck paying you for everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably part of what he's, he's hoping for that, obviously. But I, I mean, yeah. he's worked, he's worked his ass off, obviously to get there. <clears throat> Oh, but it, it's just in your so head now, people. man. You're never going to get it out. It's just. No, I, I can't. But the thing is, too, it's like <laughs> I, I weigh like the pros and cons. Like, do I really have the time to go out and learn how to be a better cinematographer when we're doing client correspondence? We have to deal with all the finances of the company. We're essentially marketing ourselves and all the yeah. other things that we have to do with running the business. And I'm like, yeah, you know, my time is better suited to handling a slew of other things along with Riker rather than sitting down and watching a 12 hour video on how to better light, like a, a two camera setup interview. Right. And, and doing, it's not even going to be as good as it's still going to take you many, many shoots and many, many hours oh of actually God. doing and not just watching. Right. Cause you can watch it, but then it, it takes so much time just to like, we have to do it and do it and do it and do it. And then you finally yeah. start to wrap your head around it, you know, but yeah. And that was honestly a hard thing for me to kind of like hard pull the swallow dish. Cause like I said, I, I, I came from a place of, teaching myself everything, how to do everything. Yeah. So it's not like, by no means did I, you know, have an eagle problem or think I was better than people. I just like was, it was, it almost came from a place of insecurity. Like I wanted people to know that I could handle it all. And I'm like, it's just, yeah. uh, it's, it, it wasn't a good place to be for that short stint that I was there. That's another, that's just another thing you learn as you go, right. As you, as you develop and your confidence grows, then you don't feel like you need to prove <clears throat> as much to others and to yourself. Or yeah. at least that's that's the case for me usually. Oh no, I, I completely agree. I, I find so much value now in in pretending that I'm like the dumbest person in the room, right? Like I never go into a room trying to seem like I'm the smartest right. guy. I'm just like right. I've been made a fool too many times <laughs> to continue with that habit. So I just try and talk as little as possible and listen as much as possible when I'm in a room with a bunch of other creatives. Smart. Um so this this podcast, as you I think you know, is is very much um artists focused um Mm -hmm. artists of all different kinds but that that was the idea but to be honest all i've really had is filmmakers and photographers on here because that's just where my passion is but yeah i have to ask you some questions around the topic of art because that i ask everyone these questions because really the reason i started the podcast is because i have imposter like a pretty uh bad case of imposter syndrome most of the time even though i've been doing this for like i I graduated school in 2009 and i started my company right away and i still have it and it's not it's pretty it's pretty minimal i would say now in like the video production world but Mm -hmm. calling myself an artist is still a big struggle for me for some some reason i don't know what it is and i dabble in all different kinds of art and in all of them i have the issue uh, so I guess my question for you is, do you, do you feel like an artist through this endeavor? Um, just photography, being a photographer, did that make you feel like an artist? And do you feel like an artist through video too? Yeah, it's, I mean, <clears throat> it's tricky. I feel like it's like a, a loaded question because on one hand, you know, I think that anything that elicits any sort of reaction emotionally from anyone it could be considered art, whether that's a painting, a photo, a video, a drawing, someone acting, any, any, virtually anything, right? The argument could be made. Everything's art. Life is beautiful. Uh, But then it comes to, you know, if if I believe in that, which I do, then theoretically I should believe that my photos and videos are art because I'm sure someone feels something watching them, but I can't bring myself really to say that because I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm a photographer or I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and people are like, yeah, you're like an artist. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. So it's, it's just tricky because I think growing up from a societal standpoint, when you think of artists, you think of like all these great people, uh, Picasso, Da Vinci, Van Gogh, like painters, people like men of the Renaissance, um, or, or even, you know, sculptors, singers, painters, dancers now. And, and I just feel like maybe filmmakers and photographers have never really been put in a societal light where they were called artists. It was always photographer or filmmaker and stuff like that. So um, it's not as synonymous with the name artist that some of these other uh, jobs are. So I feel like maybe it's just that mental barrier in me that 
can't bring myself to call myself an artist, although I'm sure people have called you and I artists at times. It's just, I don't know. That's that's actually a really fair point. When you think about, I, we've all heard people say this, like you, they'll be talking about a filmmaker, like a director, someone that's like eccentric, say, mm -hmm. and you'll hear them say, oh, he's an artist or like she's an artist. And it's like, so why, what makes them an artist? Cause they're like weird. Like, cause they do like they're, they're out of the box like that. That's what people, they, I, I think you're right. We don't always associate filmmakers as with being artists. Right. But if they're weird enough, then it's like, oh, they're, oh, he's an artist. And it's like that. Mm -hmm. Why weren't, why is it, why aren't we all artists? Like, I don't know if that's really like fair. Um, but it's interesting to hear you say that you, you struggle there too. So what is the reason? Like, I know you just explained it, but really like there's something in there that yeah. is, is inhibiting you from being able to, to just say it or like taking it as a compliment or whatever. It's, I don't know if it's a compliment or not, but yeah, I, it's, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it boils down to what you said earlier, just about, you know, experiencing some form of imposter syndrome. Um, anything that's traditionally, my opinion, anything that's traditionally outside of the, the typical nine to five sort of structured job. Mm. Um, it's, I don't know. I just, I always have this, when does it become a place of artistry really? Right. Cause if I think of people yeah. like Quentin Tarantino, Scorsese, or even, um, um, Christopher Nolan, I, I wouldn't even be, I mean, like they're artists hundred percent. Do you like, do you see the cinema yeah. that these, these people create? But then, you know, when I think about myself and other people, I'm like, okay, well then where on the spectrum do you obtain that title of artist, right? That's, <laughs> exactly. that's the tricky part because theoretically, you know, there's some people who do art who get literally zero recognition and then they might pass away and then 10 years may pass. Someone might discover a painting or a picture or a yeah. song they did. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. They were a true artist. But at their time, I highly doubt at any point they thought to themselves, I'm an artist, like right? It. Yeah. But again, you know, we're our own worst critics. So I think being such, we might be the last person to call ourselves an artist compared to the, to the masses. Right. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. That's a I, line. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure someone out there is like, I'm an artist and I know that. And you know, all the power to you. I just, I don't think my confidence is at a place yet or I would feel confident. I think if someone called me on it, like what makes you an artist? I couldn't answer. I'd be like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I take photos and people <laughs> tell me they like it. I don't know. I feel like I'm backed into a corner now. Right. So, um, what do you yeah. need to do though? Like what? That's, that's the thing. I really, I really don't know because, you know, I've only been at this for three and a half, four years now, which in, for all intents and purposes is, is still pretty much in its infancy for me, at least it is. Um, with how many pivots I've had along the way too. I haven't really been on one, like this is probably the the most narrow trajectory we've been on so far. And it's been a year and a half. So um, I don't, I wouldn't even know what I would consider myself an art. You know what? Maybe, maybe it's when I buy a house and I have a lot of my prints that I'm stoked about hanging on my walls not on anyone else's walls, but my walls, like photos that I'm stoked enough that I have there, then yeah, maybe I'd, mm. I'd consider myself an artist, right? Um, maybe some of those ones you were talking about where you go to the woods and you toss them on your laptop and you've never shared them with anyone. And maybe that's, that's the thing you... too. That's that's probably the photos that I would most likely yeah. print off because those have the fondest memories associated with them, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a really, that's a really cool idea by the way like i i wanted to actually ask you that earlier i i, I forgot um when you're talking about the fact that you don't share some of your stuff like what what's the reason for that is it because it's it's a personal thing obviously right like i would i would say it's kind of um it's like a twofold answer um much like you know they I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this um so I'm very wary of the concept that confidence built on compliments will collapse under criticism. So when I'm posting things to Instagram and I get a bunch of comments or likes, people share them to their story. They to like, this is such a beautiful photo. You're so talented. I'm very cautious not to like let that 
penetrate deep inside me because then the moment that I don't get those nice comments or I don't get as many likes, I start to then base my value on that piece of work from those metrics. And, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm aware of it. I've seen it happen firsthand with myself. Um, and ironically enough, and I don't know if this is some sick twisted game from the universe or God or whatever you may believe in, but my favorite pieces and bodies of work that I've posted have historically done the worst. And I almost mm-hmm. kind of like it that way. Cause it's almost serves as a reminder. It's like, you love this. That's why you posted it. This number doesn't mean anything. So back to your question, I think the reason why I don't share some things is I think part of it's out of fear that people won't like it. And I don't deem it worthy because of such, which pains me to even admit that. Um, but then, yeah, the other half is definitely sometimes I'll take a photo that just strikes a chord with me and I almost feel like protecting it. And I don't want to share with people because if I, people tend to ruin beautiful things. So I'm like, as long as I keep this image for me, Mm. it's almost like my secret. And anytime I go back to look at it, or if I want to go back and re-edit it, it's like only I get the privilege of seeing this. And it almost just like makes me appreciate it that much more because there's something tied to that, whether it's a feeling or a memory or reminds me of someone. Dude, I love that. That is so, that's beautiful. Yeah. It's a neat way of looking at it sometimes, so. I never thought of that. And I <laughs> I think you just cracked something inside of me, man, because <laughs> I I am so, so guilty of not bringing my camera anywhere. Like, a, I just don't. Because, like, I, I have got two dogs. I hike every day. Um, I never bring my camera because I feel like it's work. Like, like you said, you don't want it to become work, but there's the the other element that i feel like every shot i take needs to be shared not everyone i never share every shot but i have it in my head that like i'm taking this shot and it's not for me it's for either for someone else or it's to serve a purpose yeah and to take that power back mm-hmm. um is basically what you're saying you're taking your i don't know what that power is whatever you call that whether that's the art, maybe that's the art that we were trying to, that we were talking about, but like you're taking that back and taking full control and ownership over that. Um, well, I have a question for you then. You you just referenced that, uh, you know, about not taking your camera with you everywhere because like it feels like work and, you know, sometimes you may wish you had brought your camera. Mm-hmm. One thing I noticed that I, I've stopped doing, I'm trying to like reverse train my mind is those times I do take my camera out, I feel like I'm getting less creative because I know now what angles may work best or may elicit the best composition that people are going to like. Right. But sometimes, sometimes I won't even like, I'll see something like, Oh, that's kind of cool visually, but I'm like, ah, that won't transition to a photo. Well, and I'm trying to really kick myself in the butt. Be like, just take a photo anyways, try a weird yes. angle. If you come out of a store and you see like an old Chrysler parked by a red fire hydrant, there's a blue building behind it. And you just like how yes. the colors go. Yes. Yeah. You know what? It might, it definitely wouldn't fit my feed. And it realistically, it's something I probably wouldn't post, but it would be a fucking hell of a shot. Yes. Right. And I know exactly. that I would love to print it and hang it. So like, yep. Do you, do you find that like, even if you do take your camera out, you're not getting as maybe as creative as you might've been in the past. Like when you first got oh, a yeah. camera, yeah, for sure. Like I have to put myself into, like you said, you, you know what the angle is, like what the typical angle would be, right? Or the angle that most people would like the most. And I think Instagram and social media has been damaging in, in that way for people who are susceptible to retraining their brain that way, to just giving pe- the people what they like. Um, one guy that I really, are you on TikTok? Well, you are on TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Have you seen Zach Dobson um, pop up I don't, in your feed? No, I don't think so. Okay. I'll definitely send you um, his page. Yeah. He's like, help me retrain my brain and he'll help you too. Like he's, he, he's like a few years older than I am. And um, he's been like doing, he's been doing it a long time. Mm-hmm. And he just, he, he's definitely got that attitude of like, I don't really care what anyone else thinks this the, i like this shot and that's all that matters and mm-hmm. he's been helping me think like that again just from watching his feed and stuff but also just the shots that he takes the stuff that he shares 
It's like unorthodox. It may not be Instagram-y at all, but it's like old school. Like it just reminds me of like film photography, you know? Mm -hmm. And he like does like history of old photographers and his stuff ends up sort of fitting in that in that same sort of genre, I guess, in the in a way that style. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I do to answer the question. Like yeah, I struggle there, but I've been actively retraining my brain, and it is possible to do. I I think if if you find the right people to help you do it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think it's like anything else, right? Like it's a muscle you can exercise and you can strengthen. Um, yep. I think it just comes from a, a, a place of like self awareness, really, and, and being present in the moment to realize when you're you know, shifting to service social media instead of servicing your creativity. Like I've, yes. I've seen, I've been out with photographers before and I'll see them take these beautiful landscape photos or, you know, <laughs> the way you would normally hold a camera. And they're like, <laughs> Oh shit, I got to get a vertical one for Instagram. And, and then it's like, that's not the composition though. Like that's I not know. What And the, the amount of like crying photographers I see when they're cropping these beautiful, like, uh, like nine by 16 images into like four by five or one by one to fit the grid. I'm like, just post a widescreen. And they're like, but it doesn't perform as well. I'm like, whatever you think looks the nicest outside of what you think would perform well, post it. Right. Like I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm yeah, guilty man. of doing it too. Making sure things like you go to my feed, everything's four by five. I like, yeah, dude. And it's like, the to colors, take like you, your, your color scheme is just like so cohesive and, yeah. But it's so funny you say that because like i'll look at my feed and like so there's this line by martin scorsese in a master class that i did when he said if you don't get physically ill at the first take of something you created he's like you're doing it wrong and anytime i go back to look at my feed i feel like i just get physically ill <laughs> and, and like some and anytime i'm feeling that way someone's like dude your feed looks great and i'm like you can't say that to me right now because i'm in like having this existential yeah, crisis of wanting to delete everything but <laughs> um it. A little like, and I, I by no means have created this, uh, this method. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen someone else on Instagram, but what I've been doing is if I have a couple of shots that I really like that look really nice in, in a wider screen format, because anything, anything posted widescreen is going to look way more cinematic in my opinion, both photo and video than a four by five or a one by one. Um, yeah. I started doing these triple stacks. So I'll, I'll crop crop like really narrow wide screens, throw three of them into Photoshop and I'll stack them in a four by five yes, sequence. And I saw that. it's nice because I find it's still one image. So instead of a multi, like multi posts are kind of cool. I, I don't mind them because they're good for like telling us like a photo story. But the good thing about the three stack, I find it serves, it serves, I'll say two, maybe three purposes. The first of which, um, you know, if you have three eh, somewhat okay shots that you want to share, you can stack them and those three shots collectively become like a really good shot. Uh, secondary, sure. uh, again, it looks more cinematic. You're not really confined to cropping the four by five. So you can really show, you know, the overall vision of, of these images. And then thirdly, like having the three images stacked, you can almost tell a story in a single image from like scene one, scene two, scene three, whether it's through a composition breakdown, top to bottom, you found a creative way of stacking it or quite literally is here's the start here's the climax, here's the resolution of my little three frame story for you to see. And, and you don't have to swipe through it to You get to it, see it all in one go and there's a lot more yeah. to, to see, right? And again, it's disruptive too. So if your goal is to get people to stop scrolling, that does help because not many people do that and it's outside of the norm, right? And it's another tactic to get people to take a second to absorb because people scroll so fast. Oh, like it's crazy, yeah. If you, if, yeah, if you really want someone to stop and look at your art and actually absorb it i mean for starters probably just don't post it on instagram because people won't stand long <laughs> enough find a medium in which you know people are actually going to take the time to absorb it or or like i said don't share it on social media and then maybe if you're hanging out with photographers like hey look at this photo i took or send it to a friend to just kind of actually absorb it um but yeah i think that's a great tactic um to you know beat some of the things that might make you hesitant to post the photo on on instagram that's cool that's really cool so you've had a viral success, like, uh, you know, a post that had 1.5 million views or something like that, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. And was that, <clears throat> did that become like something that you wanted to try to obtain again? Did that become like a drug or did you kind of, so, were you able to let that be? It was, it was almost the reverse. So for as long as I could remember when I first started Instagram, my goal was to hit 10,000 followers, right? I just wanted a K 
next to my follower count. I wanted to be able to allow people to swipe up back when I had these grand visions of being a YouTuber content creator. Um, and yeah, my, my, I guess my happiness barometer was set up to 10 K once I hit 10 K I was like, things are going to change for me. I'm going to be happier. People are going to respect me more. People are going to like my work. And then I, I organically got myself up to around 8,000 followers or so throughout the course of three years on Instagram. Um, and then, yeah, um, after that trip to Iceland, I posted that one reel. It got like 1.4, 1.5 million views. Um, and then the, the next three or four reels I posted that they all got around 300,000 ish views. Um, wow. and then my, my account went up to just over 20,000. Um, and as soon as I got that, like the first 30 minutes, I saw that number and I woke up in the morning, I was like, Oh, this is, it's like a fucking superpower. Like I feel great. Like, what do I do next? Right. Like I felt I was on cloud <laughs> nine and then by lunchtime it had completely fleeted and I was back down to where I was when I was hoping to hit 10 K as far as like a happiness scale goes. Right. Cause like, wow. I, like not I, even a day, like just not even a day, not even a yeah. day. Yeah. And now even now people like, who you know some of my friends who aren't super active on social media like dude you're like twenty thousand followers like you're like popping off like things must be going great i'm like literally nothing's changed i haven't got another job i haven't got any opportunities like i had more opportunities weirdly enough come in when i had less than ten thousand than i have now and it might just be like a timing thing but i just i i quickly realized how little value there is in the follower count it's it's up up scene and how how the average person views it like i'm i'm very analytical in a sense of like uh you know when i when i was trying to actively grow my social media i was tracking all the metrics that i could for my socials like how many likes how many shares how many comments how many likes are other people getting like you know what content seems to be popping off certain people and i was super methodical and and i mean i still have Excel spreadsheets with hashtags, depending on the type of photo and the mood and the color grade I had. Um, I was like heavily into it almost to a point of like, it's just not healthy. Cause then again, I'm posting for the purpose of just engagement, not things that I like. And um, yes, yeah. I mean, so again, to the average person and a lot of um, not so well-informed businesses, they see a number and they associate that with things like success or, or notoriety. And they, they might want to work with people like that. And, and I see it all the time with like these influencers who are getting these contracts and I'm like, you know, I'll do like a little deep dive into their, their analytics and be like, okay, yeah, they have like 50 to a hundred thousand followers, but like, you know what you said earlier, like they're getting two, three comments and a couple hundred likes. Right. So that leads me to believe either they bought a bunch of followers or maybe they, they went up viral off one post early on, yeah. gained a massive following, but it, that, that doesn't transition, like you said, organically to keep up with that loyal audience. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, you gotta be really wary because like it really doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean their works better. It doesn't mean people like them more. It's just someone saw one piece of content and it was like, oh, cool. Follow. And probably never saw that account again. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, it, you, you don't, you don't bank on, so like you said, you don't get any work. You didn't get any extra jobs from that. Um, no, I could, I could probably count on one hand how many jobs I've gotten from my Instagram, like for row productions, one hand. So what other than networking and your business partner, you know, having that networking background and all that stuff and making those contacts, um, you said it's just word of mouth. So that just means you're producing a high quality product. And also when you're a video production company, that also means that you guys are delivering a really good client experience to your client. Um, so that, that's, that's the, the key, right? I would say that's the biggest thing. Uh, a lot of people downplay it, especially in, in the creative space, whether you're a photographer or, or a filmmaker, videographer. Well, like I, I personally, I don't care about titles. I know a lot of people forget. It's like, I'm not a videographer. I'm a cinematographer or like I'm a director or I'm yeah. a, I'm a whatever it is. I'm like, I don't care like, either. I don't care. Call me a content creator. Just yeah. don't call me an influencer. That's like the one thing. Just don't yeah, call me no an influencer, influencer, please. <laughs> but um, I always tell people, you know, you yourself are just as much the product or service that you're selling as, as the actual video or the digital assets. I was like, when we're on set, you know, 
we're professional, but we're also like lighthearted. We're fun. You know, we'll read the energy in the room. We'll try and match it. We'll try and elevate it a bit. Like we want them to have a really good time shooting with us, right? Like, yes, we want you to be stoked on the final product, but I want the day that we're in there filming or there are multiple days that we're filming with you. I want to build some por- some sort of repertoire with you, a relationship. I want you to remember that experience just as much as the final product because if you can make sure they're having a fucking blast and they just love the day of filming and it's super relaxed when they go to watch your video, when it's delivered, they're subconsciously think about how much fun they had creating this video with you and they feel more involved in the experience. And then they're just going to like the video more, even if it's, I mean, the video would be no better regardless of the experience theoretically, but they're going to like it more because they like you more. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that, man. Um, I guess we should wrap soon. So what let's, let's just expand on what you just, what you just talked about. If you could, if you could give someone a piece of advice in that area, who, who is not maybe super confident working with clients. Cause I think that that takes time and, and it's amazing that you guys, you've been doing this for two years. I mean, you've been in it four years, but in that time, it, it's amazing to me. Um, how far along you guys are. So you're obviously doing something right. You're the right kind of people too. Like that makes a difference. Your, your energy, like you said, um, you're just obviously cool people to, to work with. Um, but someone who's starting out and has like lacks confidence in that area um, mm-hmm. as a beginner, do you have mm-hmm. any advice? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky because it, it is super dependent on the person. You know, um, I wouldn't stress too much. Uh, if you're new to the industry and you're worried about, you know, where you're going to fit in, how you're going to carve out space for yourself. One thing I have realized is it doesn't matter where on the skill spectrum you may be currently at. And and keep in mind, you can upgrade yourself as high as you want, depending on how much you want to work and how hard you want to work. Like you're not stuck at any rung on the totem pole, right? Um, but there's work all along that spectrum. There's always work. There's never a shortage of work. That's the one thing that's always blown my, blown my mind. So, um, Don't panic. If you're not great with clients or you feel like you're not giving like the best upbeat experience, you're going to have a multitude of jobs to, to train that muscle in you. Like the amount of awkward shoots that I've had where I know the clients might've felt awkward. They weren't stoked. Like for every great experience I've had in this industry, I probably have five or six where I'm like, shit, that could have been so much better, right? The end product could have been better. The shoot could have been better. The correspondence, my relationship, how I talked. Cause I'm, I'm a heavy introvert, like 99% of the time. And I really have to switch it on when I'm with clients sometimes, cause sometimes I just want to be quiet and, and, you know, stay withdrawn to myself. Um, but yeah, you just have to be willing to fail. I think that's the, the biggest issue. And the only way you're going to get better is through failure at the bottom of failure. That's where you're always going to get your best lesson. So You know, don't go in and into it thinking this is going to be a great shoot. I'm super stoked. And then when you fail to meet those expectations, don't beat yourself up. It's okay. Like I said, you're going to have five or six of those for every one great one you have. Just get very comfortable and become really good friends with the thought of failure. Know that it's not there to deter you. It's not there to stop you. It's not there to actually make you fail. It's just there to sharpen your skills, make you better, give you tougher skin. So eventually when you get on these bigger sets and you're dealing with bigger clients, it's a breeze. It really is. Wicked advice, dude. Wicked advice. Thanks. Hey, I have to ask you one more question before we go. I, yeah, I, fire. I want, and I know we're going way back to the beginning. Yep. Um, so you said your dad and your brother were military as well. Yes, yeah. Okay. Both in the Air Force. Both in the Air Force. And you decided, okay, I'm going to follow along in their footsteps for a number of reasons, as you mentioned. But then you left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you disappoint your dad by doing that? And was that like a hard decision? Like from that relationship standpoint to be like, okay, I'm leaving the military. It seems like a crazy thing for, I feel like for a lot of people that have military families being like, I'm going to leave and I'm going to be an artist now, dad. Or like, I'm going to go and just like be a photographer now. Like how was that? Uh, honestly, it was, it was super seamless. My parents have always been, uh, you know, my biggest fan. They've been super supportive through everything. Um, you know, when I first said I want to jump off of the camera, might not have been like the highest stoked levels on behalf of them, <laughs> but more so from a, a place of concern because they wanted to make sure that, you know, I was still being able to afford to live. Um, but yeah, coming out of the military, um, 
I never, I don't think I ever really had that concern because my dad was always really clear on the fact that like, I just, whatever makes you guys happy makes me happy. I just want to make sure, you know, you're healthy and you're not depressed. And he's like, and if, if the military is not making you happy, he's like, leave. And, you know, I had the luxury that my brother released after six years. Um, and I, I was still in for a year and a half, maybe two years after he released. So he had already gotten out and he went back to school for astrophysics. So I already knew that coming out, there'd be really no issue on, on behalf of my parents. And, and sure enough, when I went back out and went back to school, they were exceptionally supportive. Um, and now with where I'm at with my film and photography career i i couldn't ask for two more supportive people like it's it's great they're literally my biggest fans like my dad got instagram literally just to follow my instagram and respond to every story and send me my own posts and it's it's super endearing it's it's really sweet it's it's nice that oh. they they like it that much so oh man that's amazing to hear you you always mm -hmm. love to hear that like families are supporting what we're doing because it's like it's not traditional you know no goodness necessarily. no um even now, even more so now, because before it was like, oh, you're a photographer, like you got the film thing and all that. But now it's like, oh, you're like, the, like you said earlier, content creator. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. Are like, I mean, are you a YouTuber? Are you? Like, yeah. Right? I hate but, the term, but I love it at the same time because I'm like, yeah. it's the possibilities are endless, right? I could be they a are. DP. I could be a photographer, right? They are, man. Good stuff, dude. Well, it was really nice chat with you. It was, it was great to meet you and um, I was just out east with uh, my in-laws and and uh, my wife in the fall, so I don't know the next time we're gonna be up back out there. But next time I'm out there, you have to we'll hit have to me get up together. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I know the yeah. best places for coffee and croissants and some of the best hikes around. So, ooh, that's all yeah. my jam, man. That's yeah. amazing. And yeah, I might have I to take some it. pictures because I think you've inspired me for sure. You have to. You cannot. Even if you take just at least yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Not on my phone. I'm gonna bring my. I'm gonna bring. No, my camera. God, please don't. No, not on the phone. The amount of people that are running around. It's like I got the new iPhone 13 Pro. It takes like just as good as photos, like professional camera. <laughs> okay, whoa, let's ease it up, right? It takes good photos. I'm not. I'm not taking it, that from you. But it does. But the control's not there. Yeah, no. And it doesn't have the same and... feeling. I gotta get. No. I, I'm working on my relationship with my camera. I gotta get. You know, we we gotta make amends. So oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you. it's it's always a love hate thing. So you just gotta. It's like marriage. It's going to ebb and flow. You just got to, you know, sometimes True. you're killing it. Sometimes you need a break. So, yeah, man, you've inspired me for sure. So thank oh, you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that means a lot to me. So, yeah, man. Um, so tell, tell the people where they can find you, uh, where you can find that awesome Instagram feed. And elsewhere. yeah, so my Instagram feed is at HFX Drifter, uh, which was originally a placeholder name. And I just got too lazy and I'm too committed at this point. Um, and then my personal work <laughs> is at, uh, at Rove dot productions on Instagram. Um, and that's where you can find mine and my business partner's work as well as our website at roveproductions.ca. And that's it. And so go cool. check it out. Cause it's inspiring shit that you guys do. It's super no, thank high you. end. That, that means so much to me. Thank you so much. Very yeah. kind. It looks awesome, dude. Okay. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, and let's no do worries, this again Quinn. sometime, man. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm always down. Honestly, it was an amazing chat and uh, I can't thank you enough for the time. So it was great chatting. It was lo lovely chatting with you, dude. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of your night and let's do it again for real. And, and next time I'm going to have some pictures to show you. I promise. Oof, done. I'm stoked. <laughs> okay, buddy. Cheers. Right, take care. Bye.